and gentlemen, please be careful of the gap between the platforms. Vinyl for me is always a timeline. And sort of what I brought today, I brought just kind of like a snapshot of the timeline of my journey through vinyl. Um, I like to talk about, you know, collections a lot because I think I'm, in this, I'm that age where we kind of grew up with, you know, physical things were the only things available. I was buying magazines, you know, buying VHS, copying tapes and all that stuff where now you can have anything. So my father was a classical guitar player by hobby. So we had a very musical family and I brought some records just, this is a kind of a glimpse of some stuff like jazz records I had growing up from my parents' collection. So everyone knows Guberto. This is like the most popular album of all time. And another Stan Getz, which you can't go wrong. And this one as well. This one actually particularly stood out just because of the guitar. It was different than just a Guberto guitar. And I have memories of my father just playing it all the time. So it was super fun to have in the house. And these are the records I took just from home. I don't have any records I took from home. A lot of these just were sitting around that ended up in my possession. So then you kind of reach middle school. I was getting into other things, and I really, you can't go wrong with Herbie Hancock. I think what's funny about this record, I've had it in like tape, record, CD, I don't know how many copies I have, but it's still one of those things where Watermelon Man was just kind of a classic. And I still want to sample it, and I still do. So that's super fun. I'm going to say classic a lot, because all I did was bring classics. So I got really into punk rock as a teenager. So I was growing up in DC, obsessed with Discord. And basically, like the, this was my number one band, Minor Threat. Um, they had a discography on CD, all their songs on one, which I still think is the funniest thing ever. They were much older than me. So I lived in the, I was growing up in the Fugazi area. So I didn't really see, I didn't see Minor Threat at all. My sister saw Government Issue, which was on one of these. So there's all these comps that came out on also my favorite label, Discord Records. So it's all DC hardcore, kind of the punk rock, kind of not dance music, not disco, not jazz. So then we move on to high school. I'm still getting into jazz as we go. And with the makeup and all the soul and stuff, I started getting to Gil Scott Heron. Uh, Roy Ayers also, that's a classic. And I mean, these jazz records just kind of are significant because it kind of sparks a timeline. Like when I first moved to New York, I remember playing this record in my first apartment. It's kind of just a classic. Gil Scott Heron, you can sample because he's timeless in the sense that whatever he's been saying for years, you kind of can relate to it now. Or you always will. I don't know. It's just good poetry, right? All right. So moving on, I'm a punk rock kid. I really like, that's what I want. Guitars, bass, punk vocals. Got a four track. I'm just exposed to this at this point, some jazz. And I see the makeup play live. I think it's a cool band, and there's a DJ, and it's like 95. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then the band started DJing. So this is like when the beginning of like the band also does DJ sets. And I was really like, wow, that's kind of cool. And it was soul, jazz, and drum and bass. And I got totally blown away by drum and bass. So. The first thing I did was buy drum and bass records, which I think is really funny. And I brought my first drum and bass record I ever bought, which is this on V Recordings, DJ Die. And then there was the birth of 31 records. This is kind of a segue because I got really into drum and bass, kind of didn't listen to house music, didn't even know much about it. And I bought my first CD was Frankie Bones, and I became obsessed with Frankie Bones. So Frankie Bones would have this factory mix series, and I was just totally hooked on them. And then I would always get excited when I found that track from that disc. So I got some of those. And I don't know, it's kind of funny when you, 
you hear a CD, or at least you did back then, or you heard a mix, or you heard a DJ play, and then you found that record, no Shazam, you feel like you found gold. And that's what happens still once in a while because it's unshazamable, it's not, you're not at, it's not on Discogs, whatever. It's fine, but I still remember that kind of feeling of discovery that you kind of can't get anywhere else online. So that was from the first uh, Frankie Bones mix that I had that I liked. And he had this series that is really cool called Bones Breaks. And I would always pick them up whenever I saw them. And it's not rocket science. He just had fun with breaks. And if you recognize that, that's a very similar design to my latest album. Because I made a record out of samples influenced by what Bones was doing. So I moved to Chicago in 97 for school. And way into drum and bass, just discovering Right before, right before then, I was uh, going to kind of some, not raves in DC, but more like parties. But once I was in Chicago, got more into the rave scene, and it was the end of that era, basically. So there were only a few left that I went to, and it was a good year. And Gramophone Records was my weekly stop for the five years I was in Chicago. Every week I'd go there, because every Wednesday, new releases, and I was really stoked to work there because as a buyer, you get first dibs for everything. And also, by working there, you hear a lot more music than the allotted time you would have on a, day, on a weekly basis. So working there, I really got into house music, what other DJs were playing, kind of opened up my world, and you, I started buying everything. So in this kind of like early 2000s, I was listening to a lot of new like old house discovering, but I guess the biggest thing for me were the guys from New York, Metro Area. They put out this record. That's still one of my favorite records. And they had a whole bunch before. This was number four, but I was there when they would sell, I don't know, 50 to 100 copies on a weekend. And that's just 20 years ago how different it was in the industry. So Morgan Guy, Starshin, they put out these records. And they were kind of like very significant for me because it opened up my exposure to more Italo disco and things like that. Uh, but like even the first Soundstream record I ever bought, there's even a date from January 2002. This is still one of my favorite records. It's a very special one because it's not so formatted as for proper DJ. Like, how he makes them now, but I just remember turning this, this record on and hearing it out loud and then hearing it in the club and how I saw like a record just go from zero to 100 in like a couple weeks. It was just incredible. And how many different DJs were buying it, so that was pretty cool. This one, this is a great label, Luxury Service. If you see it, buy any of these. Uh, it's a Rob Mello alias, but he would make these incredible disco, loopy house productions that, you know, I don't know, just would find, be very helpful in any set. This is actually a really good segue into the New York years. So 2000, early 2000s, we're starting to see this new disco revival in New York or all over the world. And you get uh, Lindstrom, Prince Thomas, Metro Area, Environ, Danny Wang, these very uh, arty guys that have been doing disco, maybe some disco house, but this whole wave of the Lindstrom, Prince Thomas, uh, was really big for me, and I really enjoyed the records. This is actually the first Lindstrom record I bought, and it's a house record. And it's totally not the same of anything that he's put out since, but it's still one of those things that I bought a gramophone, 2002. But yeah, this is my favorite Todd Terrier. Full pup. Uh, Wrong Music New York. Wrong is, you know, like a, they did originals, edits. This was a Prince Thomas edit only 12 that I remember definitely made the rounds and was a big importance to me just because of uh, Prince Thomas. Like, I don't he only had a handful of records out. Now the guy makes an album a year. Um, but 
just quality disco edits. And this kind of paved the way for me in particular too because this is around the time where I started doing more edits and learning. I moved from Pro Tools to Ableton and I was working a lot with Marcus for our runaway project, but also on my own, I was just experimenting a lot. So people like Prince Thomas and these Noid releases. It's not your typical Noid, which is Idiot Boys and Ray Meng related. Ray Meng is one of my favorites, who I'm proud to say I actually became better friends with over the years. Avoid the Noid. Right, did I get that right? Avoid the Noid. Um, I just like talking about these. This one is Serge Santiago. It's a war, it's a Cano edit. This record's very important because this guy, Serge Santiago, is now with one half of Ways and Odyssey. And uh, when he did this, he did a few in this variation, but he basically took the whole edit game to the next level with his production. And it sound, he made this sound like a brand new record. So Cano, it's a war. This is also a very, this is important, Ron Hardy. Ron Hardy passed away way too young. Um, Chicago DJ, look him up. He made tons of edits. There's a ton of mixes that are now on YouTube, but they didn't used to be. So when you got your hands on a Ron Hardy mix, which I only had a handful of from DJ history, um, there were some really good ones. And what happened in the mid-2000s is somebody made Ron Hardy edits. So somebody listened to the edits. I don't know the whole story. These I got at Hard Wax in Berlin. And at the time, they were the only two Ron Hardy edits, and the mystery's still out on that. I don't know who made them, but they're awesome. And now there's Ron Hardy labels that put out all his edits from those mixes. And there are millions, of course, I'm exaggerating. There are quite a few Ron Hardy mixes online, and they never get old. They're always entertaining. They're always packed with his own stuff. And then he'll throw in something like the OJs, another classic that's been re-edited time and time again. But the original is pretty good. You don't need an edit. Undisputed Truth. This is actually a really important record, too. Moody Man. We all know Moody Man, right? This is on Carl Craig's Planet E but it's Dem Young Sconies. And this record is an Italo record chopped up to bits. It's techno. Very important, because it's taking something completely out of context. And I hope there's a snippet of that you hear. That's good. And sometimes there would just be good disco records. I've played this record hundreds and hundreds of times. I don't know why, but it just always stays in my, in my bag just because I enjoy it too much. Probably need to edit that out. I'm embarrassed that I do that. Same with this one, Paul Lewis. Girl, you need to change your mind. It's a great label though, right? Cool, cool cover. And speaking of cool covers, I always like Italo, and I'll finish with just some Italo stuff on the right side, so you can't tell. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Uh, this is a funny label, sorry. Uh, Italo's over is really funny, memory. Uh, it's always a fine line with Italo because it's super cheesy. There was nothing, no hiding about it, but every once in a while there's just one hit out of 100 that makes it stick, and this was one of them for me. Um, and that's it. That's what I brought. So these are all a bunch of records that either from my childhood through high school, I don't know, it's, I can't let go. And I know a lot of people can get rid of records. I have over 10,000 records. Um, it's rare that I get rid of anything just because it's part of my life. And maybe it'll go into storage or maybe I'll bring it out again. But it's always uh, a good timeline story to have when I go back in time, I remember when I got something and what you don't get from digital. So that's my story. <laughs>